of their degree. So co-requisite remediation, uh, uh, hopefully everyone on the uh, on the call knows exactly what we're talking about. I know many of you, sure enough, have been you know been involved in it right from the very start. But of course, uh, for those I know, we have a few people on the call today who, uh, who who maybe are not quite as familiar. The idea here is that students uh, will be enrolled directly into a credit bearing class, the credit bearing class that they need to satisfy their general education requirement and then are simultaneously enrolled in some kind of supplementary instruction experience, what we call the requisite experience. So requisite experience then enables them, supports them, uh, provides the uh, the extra support that those students need to be successful in the requisite class. And this is a slide that I know many of you have seen in some iteration of many times to, that really compares uh, what set us up to fully implement co-requisite remediation back in fall of 2018. That the the blue uh, the, the the blue curve uh, shows the success rates of students who began back in 2013 in uh, a traditional sequence of developmental education. So began in intermediate algebra or some uh, developmental class of that kind, and then having completed that course then moved on into the credit bearing class that they needed having completed that uh, that dev ed course or that sequence of dev ed courses the blue the blue bar is not showing what proportion of those students completed the the intermediate algebra class it's showing what com proportion of those students completed the the credit bearing class so that whole sequence finalized finally you know finally uh, culminating in the credit bearing class within that first academic year. And what we're showing is how that varied by preparation, by math preparation. The, the, those students, uh, they what I'm showing here is it uh, 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 with ACT math subscore, or if they took the SAT or AccuPlacer, then converting that score onto that same uh, th that same scale. So we can compare success rates based on students coming in with differing preparation. Clearly, we know all of our schools serve different populations of students who come in more or less prepared. And all of those students live somewhere on that, somewhere on that, uh, that, on that spectrum. So that's the blue bar, and you can see overall about 20% of those students back in 2013 finished out the academic year uh, the, with credit for that uh, that credit bearing math class that they need to graduate and I think many of you know that we now know that success in that math and English class literally increases their likelihood of overall success by a factor of 10 so crucial that we're able to do that within that first academic year the green bar again just for completion the green bar is when we moved in 2015 uh, to to introduce a foundations approach, compressing that remediation into a single semester, but still a prerequisite experience. And then the red bar is is now comparing those success rates for those students in a prerequisite approach. So um, across our schools, uh, between the years 2015 and 17, there was a gradual increase of the numbers of students who were being uh, provided the opportunity to take their math course and their English course uh, using the requisite approach, but still, uh, even at the end of 2017, uh, still only around 50 or so percent of the of the, room, the developmental students in mathematics were enrolled through that requisite approach. Still, the features that led us to move to full uh, implementation were very clear. That for every student across the full spectrum of preparation. All of those students were much, much, much more likely, two, three, four times more likely to successfully complete their credit bearing math class within their first academic year than using any of the other approaches that we had. And this, uh, again, I think you know that this this data has now been replicated across a number of different states and a number of different settings, seeing this same kind of picture. So that all then set the stage for us to fully implement uh, co-requisite in fall 2018. Here is the way that that data looks. So the purple bar is now the full implementation data, the full implementation data of implementing co-requisite across all 26 of our schools. Every student who came in requiring uh, remediation in mathematics enrolled directly into the credit bearing class that they need uh, for their degree, either 
uh, they were headed towards calculus and so consequently needed college algebra, or were in a, 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 a non-calculus based discipline and so consequently took math modeling or quantitative reasoning. And what you can see is we were able to scale that up to full, uh, full implementation while still maintaining that still uh, that maintaining that, that 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 very stark increase in success for all of our students all across the preparation spectrum. In fact, we not only maintained that uh, success rate, you can see that we uh, we modestly increased it up to uh, up to sixty uh, 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 sixty eight percent. So huge uh, 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 huge progress. Again, an enormously big thank you to to many of you who I know worked so hard to bring about that full implementation. So that's the, the, the way the full implementation looked. So what it looked like in mathematics. Uh, and of course, that was part and parcel of other work that we were doing across uh, gateways to completion and other kinds of course, course redesigns in mathematics. And you can see across 2016, 17 and 2018, a very significant increase over those, even over those two or three years in the proportions of students who again, were able to pass uh, with a C or better, either college algebra, quantitative reasoning, or math modeling. Of course, that that, that doesn't even uh, take into account even fuller student, other students who were taking calculus or other 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 higher uh, higher mathematics courses too. So tremendous progress in uh, in improving mathematics success for students across those three years. It's the picture in mathematics. Uh, very similar picture in English. So you can see here's the the, the picture for uh, our freshman writing classes, English 1101. And again, the the blue chart was the uh, the approach, uh, the traditional approach, where students came in and took uh, developmental writing before they went into the uh, the credit bearing writing class uh, in 2015 through 17. Again, we we had uh, a number of schools who tried a variation, various variations of prerequisite remediation. Uh, providing a one semester kind of remediation followed by the credit bearing class. Both of them ended up with success rates kind of in the mid 40% of students who successfully completed their freshman writing class again in that fir critical first year. Uh, but you can see that again, co-requisite uh, almost produce, produces success rates that are almost double the, uh, the, the success rates we had using those other approaches. And again, that's sim that, that very similar kind of success rate all across the preparation spectrum. Again, we the, this was some critical uh, design principle for us here was to try to find a, a, an approach which not worked for just some of our students, but worked for all of our students, no matter their incoming preparation. And you can see the kinds of successes that we had there in um, in gateway math classes or gateway gateway English classes. All right, so so that was the sort of the 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 overall data again broken out crucially by, by preparation, so we can really see a fuller picture. Uh, but but that's not the only ways in which we need to pay attention to making sure that co-requisite works for all of our students. That of course uh, we want to make sure that uh, the, that this is an approach which works for students uh, students of various races, students of various income, ages. That's exactly right. And so, uh, so, so what I want to do at least today is I'm not going to I'm going to show you a lot of data today, but I, I'm not going to break down by every possible disaggregation. Uh, but I am going to show you how those same uh, success rates in uh, success rate charts in math and in English look when we break out by race. And here I'm uh, specifically focusing on breaking out uh, those students by. So showing you African American students, Latinx students, uh, white students, and then of course the the purple bar, just as it always has been, that's that dotted line that's sort of interwoven amongst the, all of those three. Again, you can see and the the kind of the gray lines underneath, just for reference, are the traditional approaches using uh, the intermediate algebra or foundations mathematics. You can see for for each of those races, we're pr producing uh, results that are much, much higher than we ever did before. And what's more, you can see that at every preparation level, really there is nothing that you could point your finger to and say that there is some kind of disparity in outcome uh, that, that's based on race. And we really have uh, 
success rates uh, for any kind of uh, disparity based on race in success rates in gateway, gateway math classes prerequisite. Similarly, very similar kind of picture when we look at freshman writing classes, again, focusing in on the, uh, the, the, the three largest racial groups here in the, in the system. And again, you can see there's nothing that you would point your finger at to say that there is anything, uh, anything approach, approaching some kind of um, disparity of outcome. A little more variation in the English classes, uh, but, 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 but nothing really, uh, uh, nothing really uh, that you would say was, uh, was um, out of keeping. So again, uh, if I, I could show you very similar kinds of pictures based on incomes and Pell versus not Pell, and age, uh, you know, traditional age students versus non-traditional age students, and and also by, uh, uh, by by gender, they look very very similar. And I know some of you may well be thinking in the math course, the math course is it's going to be a common theme today that I am going to kind of take all of those three math courses together: uh, college algebra, math modeling, and quantitative reasoning. Uh, but but, but it is in fact the case that if I showed you the charts broken out by each of those math courses, then I get you, you get data which is strikingly similar to, to, to what it is that I'm showing you when they're all together, which is the reason uh, why I'm showing you them, them all together in that way. But of course, happy to share that, that data uh, uh, as well as anything else that I'm showing you today. So uh, that's the, the kind of the, the picture when we disaggregate math classes by race, by uh, uh, and also by by uh, by preparation, uh, what we now want to do is to begin to, to 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 look forward to say, well, those are the results that we have. Um, are there are there windows for us to be able to see how we still might be able to improve what we have? Because the reality is that in math we still have success rates in the mid 60s, and in English in the in the low 70s, there are still a sizable proportion of students who are still uh, not uh, able to be successful in passing their math class and their English classes in the ways that we would uh, we would like for them. And so what I want to do is really to spend the, 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 the remainder of the time today looking at two avenues, two avenues for us to still be able to uh, to, to be able to make progress and, uh, and perhaps uh, still improve ways in which we can serve our students better. So the first is around academic mindset. And I think uh, I think many of you know that for the last really for the last three years, and this is uh, we're just right now beginning to to do the fourth uh, uh, administration of this. We have been uh, giving a, a large scale academic mindset survey to our students, to our in, entire incoming freshman class, uh, really for the last the last three years. And gradually over those years, the the numbers of students who have been willing to fill out that survey and provide that data back to us uh, has been steadily growing. So now I think we had over 16,000 responses from students in the, the in the last academic year. And, uh, and, and in just a second, I'll be able to show you um, some of the data that we're getting from that. So the idea is that in this academic mindset survey, we ask students to tell us about themselves, tell us about their attitudes to, uh, to, to themselves as learners. How do they feel about themselves as learners? How do they feel about interacting with the learning environment around them? How do they feel uh, as they interact with the material that they're trying to learn? And the, the big takeaways from that are that we now have really established some large scale academic mindset drivers that, that both on the one hand, uh, um, amplify a student's ability to be able to su be successful in these freshman level classes, but also, on the other hand, may, may, may also actually inhibit or stifle a student's ability to, to be successful in ways that they otherwise would be able to be. And those, those aspects are what I'm showing you on the screen right now. That first of all, perceived purpose of coursework, that, that how crucial it is that students understand the, why it is that they are learning material that is being presented to them. What's the purpose of it? How does it connect with why it is that they've come to college? How does it connect with that purposeful choice that they've made about the degree program that they are in and where it is that that degree program is leading? And so purpose of coursework is a, an enormous aspect of success. Feeling 
connected to their institution, feeling that they belong. This idea of social belonging is also a very powerful aspect of whether or not students are able to flourish in, uh, in their ability to, to, to master uh, challenging material. Um, believing that they are capable of learning the material. So I know many of you are familiar with Carol Dweck's work of growth and fixed mindset. And that's exactly what we're what we're looking at here. And what we what we see here is is more than simply uh, the students um, the, the students' attitude towards their own growth and fixed mindset. Do they believe that uh, the struggle that they're having with material is just simply confirmation that people like them just can't learn this stuff? Or is that struggle instead something that they interpret as, yeah, you know what, when you're trying to learn hard things, struggle is what learning feels like. And I can overcome the struggle and the struggle will simply help me to be able to, to understand the material more fully. So that, that idea of being able to wrestle hard material to the ground and still come out on the other side and, and working hard to be able to master that, that's this idea of growth and fixed mindset. We know that that has a powerful impact on students' ability to be able to be successful. What we also see is how important it is that faculty members convey a growth mindset to their students, that we, we, we asked our students for their impressions about how it is that their faculty view the students in their classrooms. The faculty simply think, you know what, some students have it, some students don't. There's not that much we can do about it. Students come in with a sort of a fixed amount of intelligence. No matter what I do, that isn't going to change. Nothing that I do can change or not change whether or not students do or don't understand this mathematics or this English. Or on the other hand, is it the case that faculty members convey this idea of growth mindset, that they believe that students who work hard and apply themselves to their work can gradually improve and improve and, and become better and better. That, we that too, we see, has an enormous impact on a student's ability to be able to be successful in that faculty member's classroom. Indeed, confidence interacting with faculty and staff. You can imagine those faculty and staff attitudes have a huge uh, part to play in whether or not students feel confident, not just asking questions, but interacting with faculty and staff in a fuller way, ways in which questions about whether or not they do, in fact, reach out for help or whether or not they otherwise isolate themselves and so consequently are not able to take full advantage of the support uh, which is provided to them. Grit and perseverance. So yes, I think we've, we've often thought that, you know, uh, the, 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 when the going gets tough, the tough hang on in there. Uh, but this is saying something else. This is looking hard at the idea of this connection between between grit and uh, Angela Duckworth's grit, uh, grit measure, and what's called deliberate practice, right? the kind of mode of learning which we need students to enter into as they are trying to master material in college. We know that that deliberate practice mode of learning is exactly what's connected with mastery learning, the kind of learning we need students to apply to these crucial skills in writing and numeracy. And so ways in which we can understand how it is that we can help students to utilize that grit to, sure enough, allow them to spend significant time in that, um, that, that deliberate practice mode of learning is a crucial aspect of their success. And then lastly, scarcity. So scarcity is a sort of a newcomer to the list. We added those questions to the, uh, to the survey just a, a, year, a year ago, but it's already the case that we can see that this, this work around so-called scarcity mindset, when we, we understand that when students or people in general experience the, the lack of something, lack of time, lack of energy, lack of money, lack of food, lack of resources, uh, so they may be food insecure, they may be homeless, they may couch surf, they, uh, all, they, they, they may not have the money that they need to be able to, uh, to, do, to pay all of their bills, all of those things, as well as creating significant complications in the lives of those students, also actually impact in a measurable way the available cognitive bandwidth that students have to be able to bring to the work that they need to do. And so ways in which we can understand how we might alleviate those aspects of scarcity mindset, we know actually effectively unlock availability of cognitive bandwidth that allows students to 
to more adequately and able match the material. So you talk about all of those, uh, all of those six different productive academic mindset aspects. For the purposes of today, I'm going to zoom in on perceived purpose of coursework, largely because I think that we we understand well how it is that we might be able to address that particular aspect. And so I kind of want to draw your attention to that aspect, the influence of it, and then also resources that are available. I know many of you are thinking hard about how to recast your course for the fall uh, in, the, in, in, the, in a new setting uh, around kind of remote learning. And so it may well be a perfect time for you to be able to incorporate some of these aspects in that newly designed course. So per, perceived purpose of coursework. So the first thing I want to do is to show you the influence of a student's understanding of that purpose. And this actually is brand new data. This is uh, the students from tw fall 2019. The, the, the grade data that those students earned in their co-requisite math class and that tied together with what they told us about their, themselves as learners and the way in think about the math class that they took. You can see that what we did was we asked them, we asked them questions. We asked them whether they thought math was useful. Is mathematics a useful skill? Is a quantitative skills useful to have? Um, if they are useful, um, when will you find them useful? Will you find them useful at some time in your future? Uh, and in fact, will you find them useful at some time in your future in the career that you're intending? And depending on the answers that we got, then I'm going to show you the different grade distributions for the students who were taking the, who took those requisite math classes last fall and the grade, different grade distributions based on the different um, the different attitude they had around that math class, the skepticism they had about how useful, how uh, the utility of that math class that they have. When here I'm showing you this, these purple bars, I'm sorry, the orange bars, I don't know I thought purple. Uh, these, these orange bars are the bars for students who said, you know, I don't think really math is useful. I have no idea why they're make, uh, making me learn this. They're making me learn it because they, they're making me, but I just don't think it's useful at all. And here's the grade distribution of uh, the, the students earned in the co-requisite math class that they were taking. So they're left then the yellow bars. These are students who think math is useful, uh, but they're really not sure that they'll ever use it in their future. Uh, they don't think it, they think in general it might be useful to people, but they just don't think that they will use it in their future. Similarly to their left is the grade distribution of students who say that they will be useful at some point in their future, but they're not going to use it in their job. They're not going to use it in their career. And then lastly, the grade distribution of students who who sure enough think that the math that they're going to learn will they will actually use it in the career that they uh, that they envisage. So what I'm going to do is to step back through those the, that grade distribution. And you can see that as, gradually as the student has a greater appreciation for the utility, not only is it the case that the DFW rate goes down, not only is it the case that more of the greater proportion of those students actually pass that math class or in an A, B, or C, but you can see that, in fact, the whole grade distribution shifts to the left. The whole grade distribution shifts in such a way that students not only pass the course, but actually earn, uh, earn higher gr grades and much more likely to earn A's and B's than their colleagues who have greater degrees of skepticism about the math class that they're taking. In fact, uh, instead of showing you math, again, if, if time were, uh, were, were, were endless, I would be happy to show you the, the same charts for co-requisite English, and you see something that looks stunningly analogous. The percentages look a little different, it's a different course, but the pattern is still the same, that, uh, the, 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 as, as those students here, uh, uh, have a, 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 a a lessening and lessening skepticism, a greater appreciation of the utility. So a smaller proportion fail, a smaller proportion get these, smaller proportion withdraw, and a much larger proportion get A's, B's, and C's, and in fact, much larger proportions get A's and B's. So as we're thinking about not only just students passing the course, but actually learning the material more deeply, and so consequently earning uh, uh, better grades, we know, of course, that that is exactly what we need for students to continue and to take other other courses that build on the quantitative skills 
that they learn in those math classes or build on the writing skills that they learn in those English classes. So consequently, these, these, these ways of helping students to appreciate the utility of what they're learning is, is crucial. Again, not only to just help them to pass, but to help them to pass and to master the material. So you might wonder, well, what can I do in my classroom that actually expresses that kind of utility? And uh, so I want to draw your um, your attention to a number of resources that uh, Jeff Galley in my Jeff Galley's group uh, here in my office is uh, distributing around uh, this summer. A number of different webinars around different kinds of pedagogies, like like tilt pedagogy. Uh, ways in which uh, exactly the way in which the class is constructed and the way in which the faculty member approaches the class itself uh, enables the students to appreciate a greater understanding of the usefulness of what they're learning. I'm going to show you exactly how that plays out because we also ask the students, well, you know what, this math class you're taking, and in just a second I'll show you English, this math class you're taking, does the math instructor uh, do they demonstrate uh, as part of the learning uh, why what we're learning is useful? Do they do they incorporate as part of the the way in which the material is presented some discussion of well why would you want to learn this? How would you use it? Why is it useful in any way? And you can see again, this is not just a situation where the DFW rate decreases, but a situation where again the grade distribution shifts significantly to the left. More students, significantly more students earning A's and B's than their colleagues who are in classrooms where the faculty member at least is not perceived by those students to have demonstrated why it is that what they're learning is useful. Doesn't mean that the faculty member wasn't in fact doing it, but the in, from the student's perspective, they didn't, they didn't perceive that, they didn't get that. Similar kind of uh, aspect exactly for the in the freshman writing class that again for those students who agree that their instructor demonstrates how what they're learning is useful uh, those students who really appreciate as you know I think it, we, we the world we live in the the written world written word is probably more powerful than it ever has been in human history it seems to make good sense that being able to wield that tool in a powerful way would be a very useful thing to be able to do. Yet it is the case that sometimes our students don't get that. They don't see why it is that learning that material has any utility to them. Faculty members where the students really uh, see, ah, I see exactly why what it is that I'm learning here, exactly how I'm going to go on to use this in other ways. They not only are much more likely to pass the class, of course, we would like them to do, but again, much more likely to earn A's and B's, much more likely to really master the techniques that we would like for them to um, to learn. So very much encourage you as, you as you prepare for this coming fall to think of ways in which you can help the students really understand and appreciate the utility of what it is that you're, you're, you're teaching them, how it is that they can use what they're learning from you in in, in, in later classes and other aspects of their degree, other aspects of their uh, of their education, and then of course other aspects of their life. That many of the skills that students learn in these freshman English and math classes are not limited simply to the academic world, but actually have tremendous utility across a lifetime. No reason why we shouldn't be really helping students to see how it is that they can take those skills and tr transfer them and use them. Uh, very powerfully throughout the rest of their lives. So purpose. Last thing I want to talk about today is uh, the different implementation models and what we are starting to learn about those different implementation models. Uh, you, you know as well as I that when we took co-requisite to scale, uh, we left in the hands of uh, of each department, each, each, each faculty group, uh, the, the ways in which exactly the prerequisite would be implemented on that campus. Would it be that uh, the, the, the same instructor would do the prerequisite course as well as the credit bearing courses? How many credit hours are going to be in the prerequisite piece? Will it be one hour? Will it be two hours? Will it be three hours? 
Um, and, and lastly, um, and certainly, well, at least lastly for today's conversation, but certainly not lastly in all the possibilities, uh, in, in the credit bearing course itself, um, will, will there be only co-requisite students? Or will there be co-requisite students and non-co-requisite non students together? So significant variations in the ways in which those things can be implemented. Campuses that had really carry out all of those different possibilities. What we now see is that there is considerable variation in the overall success rates that students are uh, achieving in different campuses. And, you can see I'm, I'm, uh, here I'm showing you the difference of success curves, success trajectories, if you will, across different uh, different different institutions in our system. Again, I've broken it out by preparation. So of course we would paint a paint a very uh, a very uh, a very limited picture if we only showed the sort of the difference in final success rate. Different campuses serve very different kinds of students, and so on some campuses the incoming uh, the incoming population of students is less well prepared than on another campus. Wouldn't be uh, wouldn't really provide the full picture to just con compare the that 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 overall success rate. Here I'm not doing that. Here I'm really showing that the success rate at each campus and exactly how that varies by preparation. And you can see here, if I sort of zoom in on two particular schools, the blue school and the red school, uh, not revealing who those schools are here today, but uh, you can see that the, the success rates for students in the blue school and the red school are strikingly different from one another. You know, vary at each preparation level by, you know, as much as 20 percentage points. And so it really is the case that it's clear it would benefit us greatly to understand what are the, in, you know, the inherent strategies that are being applied at one school rather than the other that might well be able to provide uh, better results uh, uh, at other schools and with other students. Same kind of phenomenon happening in mathematics. You can see significant variation school to school. Again, let me zoom in on two particular schools, the green school and the blue school, different schools, different approaches. But again, you can see a variation of anything up to 20 percentage points in the underlying success rates for students in those gateway math classes. And again, uh, it isn't the case that this is just simply more students taking college algebra or quantitative reasoning or something like that. It isn't about that. Even if we correct for those things, we still see the same kind of variation. So what I want to do for the re remainder of the day is to kind of dig into these, these sort of 12 possibilities uh, that, that exist. As I've said, we have this possibilities where uh, the, 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 the course the, the co-requisite course and the credit bearing course are taught by the same instructor, that there are only co-requisite students in the credit bearing class. And the co-requisite course itself is has one hour, two hours, or three hours. And similarly, you can see all the other 12 possibilities that it may be a mixed class of co-requisite and non-co-requisite students with a different instructor for the co-requisite and the credit bearing class again with one hour, two hours, or three hours, and all of those other 12 possibilities. What I want to do is to show you how it is that uh, I've tried to fish out uh, which of those particular implementation models uh, seems to produce the produces results which serves our student population the best uh, in the best way that we uh, that, that, that we can anticipate. Uh, and what I want to do is to sort of lead you through that analysis because it has clearly has to be done carefully because there are potentially so many uh, confounding variables here. What I'm going to do is to 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 show you the the, the different the different success rates, the different uh, advantages or lack thereof of these different 12 strategies, and I'm going to do it here on this two dimensional bubble chart. Let me kind of lead you through what we're looking at and then I'll kind of lead you through piece by piece what it is that we find. In the, in, the, in the vertical axis, the vertical axis of this bubble chart is, is simply whether or not, so above the x-axis, so at the top, are, are, are strategies which produce overall pass rates that are 
larger than the system average. So being above that, uh, being at the top of, on the top half of the chart means that the students are earning are passing the class at, at rates that are above the system average for mathematics courses. And similarly, below, on the bottom part of the chart means that the, those strategies are producing pass rates that are less than the system average. The left to right, left to right is a statistical measure that measures how well how well that strategy, how well that strategy is serving the student, the, the student population. So in other words, as we as we look uh, on the right hand side of the chart, these are strategies which are, are, are producing success rates for students all across that preparation spectrum that are higher than higher than the, the system average. On the other hand, so on the left hand side, what it's meaning is that even whether it doesn't matter whether students are, uh, are, are come in less well prepared or mediumly prepared or very well prepared, all of those students, when we compare them to their colleagues who are similarly prepared, are actually earning, uh, are, are, are less likely to be passing the math classes that they're taking than their, than their colleagues. So that's the left and right and up and down. And then the size of the size of each bubble is just uh, in proportion to to how many students, uh, how many students took the course in that kind of uh, combination of strategies. So a big circle means lots of students took the course in that manner. A small bubble means just a few um, or many fewer students took the course with that combination of, of strategies. So what I'm going to do is to sort of to go through combinations of strategies one by one so we can start to see how it is that they compare and you can see that the the variation uh, in these different kinds of strategies is, is is quite considerable so first of all one hour of co-requisites so these are all of the four possibilities for one hour of co-requisites so all of these strategies they all have one hour in their co-requisite section but uh, one of these one of these bubbles is for the same faculty member in both co-requisite and credit bearing with the mixed class and then the mixed class with different and the different you get all four possibilities and you can see no matter which of the ways in which the faculty or which way in which the uh, the course itself is constructed doesn't matter whether it's a mixed class or not or same faculty member or not the fact that there is only one hour of co-requisite in this mathematics course, uh, you can see that it is neither producing an increased pass rate nor producing success rates that are serving their pop the, the student population uh, in a way that's advantageous to them. So you can see that there, there seems to be some significant drawback in using one hour of a one hour co-requisite experience. Uh, Similarly, a mixed class, different faculty members. So you can see here now these are the, the two bubbles that represent mix, a mixed class, co-requisite and non-co-requisite students together and di a diff different faculty members, both uh, in a different faculty member in the co-requisite section and in the credit bearing section. Again, so this is using either two hours or three hours. Again, it doesn't seem to, it varies some depending on which of those strategies it is, but either way, those are producing success rates across the system that neither produce an increase in pass rate nor overall producing a success, a success rates that seem to serve the student population better. So our third set of bubbles. So this is only co-requisite same faculty members. You can see this is in stark contrast to what we've already seen. And now these are the two uh, success rate bubbles that, are, that represent those students who are who, who took courses where the they used the, the the same faculty member taught them in both the co-requisite section and in the credit bearing section. And also that when they went to their credit bearing class, the only students who were in that credit bearing class were co-requisite students. So let me clarify exactly how it is that these different, these different uh, students are being classified rather than, as I have in the past, kind of depending on uh, different campuses reporting, well, this was the strategy that we like to apply. Instead, what I've done here is to literally go down to the student, the student level in the data, that for each particular student, 
each student is classified in this data analysis in the way that that particular student uh, per, um, experienced the way that they were learning their math for. So if per, for that particular student, they had the same instructor uh, in both of those two experiences and only had only were in a class with other co-requisite students and of course had two or three hours in their co-requisite experience, then they are counted in these light blue bubbles. If on the other hand, even though maybe on that campus they use other strategies often, in fact, you know, what we see is that on different campuses, different sections somehow end up, you know, end up using different kinds of strategies sometimes, I'm sure, based on availability of faculty or classes, all kinds of other aspects. Then, so the student is not classified based on what the campus says is their overall strategy, but literally what each student actually experienced. So you can see those light blue are, are the, the light blue bubbles are showing that for the only co-requisite and same faculty, we're getting uh, exactly what we want, both increased overall pass rates with exactly what we would like, but more than that, we're also seeing that actually the student population who are experiencing that strategy are actually being ad significantly advantaged by being able to, to go through that set of strategies. Uh, just to complete the chart, I'll put in the last two. You can see mixed class, same faculty, and only co-requisite different faculty. That's kind of a you know a six and one and a half a dozen of the other of the the other approaches. And you can see we get kind of a mixed picture that sometimes we're getting things that are uh, advantageous. Sometimes we're getting things that are much less advantageous. But neither are producing results that are as powerful as what is the strategy that for mathematics it seems the data is suggesting that we now see clearly that uh, the, the data says that the strategy which is the most advantageous for mathematics is a strategy where a strategy combination where we're using the same faculty member for both the co-requisite and the credit bearing experience a class made up of only co-requisite students and using either two or three hours of uh, of, of co-remediation, not one hour as uh, as often being employed. So that's mathematics. Um, let me flip over to English and do a similar kind of analysis. Again, the same kind of idea, left to right, serving that student population more effectively all across the preparation spectrum, and then vertically just simply increase in overall pass rate. Yeah, let me look at one hour of co-requisite. So you can see here, we don't see uh, quite the picture we had before, but actually for three of these, for three of these uh, combinations of strategies, one hour is, as we saw for mathematics, not advantageous. But for another, uh, for another, it does seem to be advantageous. And in fact, it is exactly the combination where it is the same faculty member with only co-requisite students. That's that bubble right there. So it is going. It is again the case that in English we we are recommending as a combination of strategies. This is the combination that seems to overall produce both increases in pass rate as well as success rates that actually advantage the student population all across the preparation spectrum. That again, faculty members who, uh, who have the same faculty member in both the co-requisite and the credit bearing class, as well as uh, using a, 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 a credit bearing course comprised only of co-requisite students. That's the combination of strategies that seems to be effective, the most effective. What's interesting is that in English, it seems as though using one hour, two hours, or three hours uh, seems to be, be effective. If you're interested in which one is the most effective, the one that's furthest to the, 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 the furthest to the upper right, it's actually the two hours. So it appears to be the case that there's a sort of a Goldilocks zone having two hours of, 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 of writing co-requisite with the same faculty member in a co-requisite section only. So with that, and I know I've sort of thrown a lot at you, I will be happy to uh, to, to try to answer any questions that I can. So um, let me see if there's a, I, I don't know that I can share my screen and see the, the chat. So I guess I'll, what I'll try to do is to uh, to, um, to to kill the the sharing, and then if I need to go back to the presentation uh, for one of the questions, then I will do that. Let me see. 
Jonathan, did you want to, should we handle questions in uh, in the chat or I'm do we want to just let this yell them out? I am looking in the chat and I'm happy to moderate in the chat. I think, uh, you know, again, this is this has some of the effect of the firehouse uh, to uh, uh, sort of a lot to take in all at once. Yes. Uh, but we invite you in. And if you uh, if you want to raise your hand, there's a little uh, there's it's a hand symbol on teams. You can tack that and raise your hand. Um, you remember you are muted, so you'll have to unmute yourself just by clicking on the microphone in order to talk. Dr. Denley, yes, this is Damon Andrews from uh, East Georgia State College. How are you? Good. How are you doing? I'm doing just fine. I have, I have two questions. Uh, sure. My first question is about uh, a lot of the data that, that horizontal access is ACT scores, but at an access institution like East Georgia State College, we don't really require test scores. So I'm trying to see how is that data teased out for students who don't submit scores. So what we've, so what we've done is to, to use any of the scores that we have. So if a student has ACTs or SATs, then of course we can use concordances to do that. And then if they have acuplacer scores, then again, we can kind of concord that acuplacer score to ACT. As you say, we certainly have students who don't have any kind of test score, those students are actually included in the overall total, but of course can be broken out in the, you know, the chart along the way. We don't know where their preparation is. But again, the, 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 in many ways, the importance of the, um, the analysis is that even at an access institution where, as you say, sometimes your students come in and they don't have a test score, so we don't know where they lie. The nice thing is that using the prerequisite approach, you can see that it sort of didn't matter where their preparation was along this spectrum, they're still achieving very strong success rates uh, where in the in the past, you know, if they, depending on where they lay on the preparation spectrum, they may have very modest success rates or even lower still. So the, as you say, it may not be for a particular incoming student that you have test scores that tell you where it is on that chart you might look, but you know in principle that a test could be given and you would know where they were and no matter where they are they're achieving success rates that are higher than the other strategies it's a great question thank you and one one quick follow-up sure as we all know uh in many cases the high school gpa is, is probably a better metric uh, mm -hmm. would it would it be possible just in the future to kind of you know do it by bin size related to high school gpa just and we, that that's kind of a little yeah. bit better metric in my mind. That's fine, and, 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 we, and we don't disagree, and we actually have those analyses for, for by high school GPA, SAT, ACT, you know, so we, we, we sort of run them with, with all of those different possibilities, and they actually look strikingly similar to one another. It's, you know, I, I guess, I don't know exactly why over the years I've used ACT. I think largely because then I don't have to bin it, right, and it's like, it's, it's you know, it's, it's 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 ten natural bins that are all sort of right there. But I, I agree. There's no reason for us to assume ACT is the preparation metric, and uh, and so uh, we can certainly use it that way. The other the other piece, which is a sort of an interesting subtlety, is that if we I don't disagree with your assessment of GPA. It's clear that high school GPA you know is a very useful measure. But the trouble with high school GPA is that we don't have the high school math GPA or the high school English GPA, if that makes sense. We only have the high school GPA that has sort of got everything all lumped together. And so in looking, in trying to measure mathematics preparation or English preparation, those other test tests that sort of directly measure those particular pieces seem to provide some sort of useful utility. Although, as I say, we have in fact done the analysis for high school GPA and it comes out looking much the same. That's a great question. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. All right, looks like, like Melanie and then Herman. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. 
Hey, Dr. Denley, this is Melanie Largen with Georgia Highlands, and I appreciate the analysis. It's really good to finally get some data on what's working and what's not working. So I'm looking forward to, to how we play this through. Um, I do want to ask a question about the only co-rec in the credit level, because I know as an institution, we have worked very hard to mix our, our co-rec students with our credit level students, thinking that we would have um, a better acclimation toward college in that in, in doing that. And so one of the arguments that's always been used is that if you only have co-rec students, that perhaps the instructor may have a tendency to inflate grades. So I don't know if you have seen that in, in your analysis and in, in your work in the past, and if you might be able to, to talk to that. So that's question one. And then question two, I'll go ahead and put it out there so I can get, get rid of the hand, is uh, are we going to track sure. these to their follow-on courses. So they finished college algebra, are we going to track these students on to how they do in 11-13 or whatever follow-on they have? So that was it. So this question is easy. The answer is absolutely. <laughs> You'll know, you know I want to do that. So to, to carry on this kind of this analysis to see, yeah, so it seems as though in the class itself we're seeing superior results and we actually again it doesn't matter which of the math classes it's the same kind of combinations in college algebra quantitative reasoning and math modeling and you know this coming fall we'll be measuring it in statistics too uh, but absolutely we will be tracking on to see is it the case that those students when they go on to future math classes that they are uh, 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 getting results that are every bit as the, the, the way that they've been in the past. I think, you know, we, we've we already, at least from, from a prerequisite point of view, watched those students in the past who have moved on into future credit bearing classes, college algebra into pre-calculus, pre-calculus into calculus. And we know that those students are performing at least as strongly as they ever did, in fact, uh, more strongly often, and the same for freshman writing. But for in English 1102 and on, students are doing better. But again, uh, you're exactly right. We we would like to go on and watch on further. Yeah, th this is sort of what's interesting. To go back to the first piece, this is sort of what's interesting about um, about this analysis. Uh, you know, the uh, you, you, I think you know I've been sort of in this prerequisite game for quite a long time, and uh, and over the years this. You know, uh, over the, year, the years, the sort of the received wisdom has been that we would do better to have a mixed class. You know, P Peter Adams, good friend, has been gone, gone all over the country over the years and said he's had the best luck with a mixed class. Lots of conversations about why it might be that a mixed class appears to produce better results. Um, this analysis seems to fly in the face of that. Now, I agree. It is the case that one might say, well, yeah, but you know, there's a possibility of um, there's a possibility of you know some kind of grade inflation or something like that. What's interesting here is that this is not, you know, it's not just one class, one institution or another institution. As I'm looking at this, so this this is a system wide picture, and so it seems to add some credence to the fact that actually it's the strategy that is. Uh, it's the strategy that's providing that, uh, that that better result, not just simply uh, uh, you know some, some something like great inflation. But I agree, if it is the case that we ever go in a direction that uh, that students are uh, alone, only prerequisite students in a section, then what's inherent in that model is that there needs to be a strong way in which we can ensure that. That those students are learning as rigorously as their colleagues uh, who are in a mixed class or a uh, you know a course who are not prerequisite. The, the rigor needs to be independent of the presentation model. I completely agree. Thanks. All right, Herman. So I think the data was really interesting. And my question, I mean, first of all, it starts a little bit with what Melanie was mentioning. It, it would be, I mean, as we attempted to do this with a, with a, a mixture, it was always a discussion of preserving the integrity on the gateway course, right? If we have only correct students, uh, then there is the opportunity. There is the, I mean, I don't want to say the risk because uh, as we're seeing now from the data, it may not be a risk that we have uh, support material and what would have been considered um, prerequisite material interwoven into the gateway course, right? We wanted to keep that completely separate when, when, when there was no developmental education happening in the gateway course. 
but I mean, the data may suggest that having some of that in the gateway course may be useful as well. Yeah. Now, the question that I have is is regarding the class sizes. I mean, as you were mentioning from the ALP was, for example, 12 students that are, are uh, let's say, deemed collegiate ready with 12 students that require support. The institutions mm -hmm. that are having this greater success on that further right uh, top bubble, were they mixing, let's say, two support courses uh, that were small into one large gateway course, or were they having a gateway course with, let's say, 30 students with also a support course that was also 30 students? No, that's a great question. And, and so uh, uh, those are the kind of questions that I'm still kind of trying to dig into. As you say, there are, you know, there's a lot of different possible confounding variables in here that we still need to try to fish out. There, there wasn't anything obvious in the analysis that I saw that seemed to suggest that, you know, these courses are gaining an advantage of having very small classes or something like that. They they run across multiple schools. And actually, what's kind of interesting is what I, what I did do is that there, there was actually enough data at some schools where I could compare students at the same school who were in different combinations of these strategies. So that at least tried to kind of get at at least some of the confounding variables because you know, schools are different and faculty members are different and all of that. And even even looking at a, at sing, a single school and looking at students, some of whom may actually be in the same class, right? So at a, in a, on a particular campus, you could have two students sitting in the same room with the same instructor, one of whom was, was experiencing the same instructor and the other of whom was experiencing a different instructor just because of who they might have had for their it makes sense. And even when you looked at only that school, we were seeing the same the same kind of you know distribution of bubbles. So again, that seems to show that the analysis is there's some weight to it. But I'm I'm certainly not pretending there isn't lots more to look into. You know, clearly we have not looked into lots, there's a lot of kind of quantitative aspects of qualitative aspects of this we also haven't looked at, like like faculty leadership and faculty training and all kinds of other uh, strategies that clearly are not part and parcel of this. It's great. It's great points. Yeah, but we, we, I should absolutely take a look and see if there's some something dramatic going on with with class size. I think I can do that relatively quickly. Yeah. Dr. Dunley, for for fall of 2018, we we did look at the data, and there's a loose negative correlation between the size of the co-requisite support class and student success in the collegiate class. Um, right, R was like R was like point one or two or something like that. that was actually, it's more like point minus point three, which is oh, minus point three. Not yeah. slightly. It's definitely, definitely negative, but I could not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But th but yeah, that definitely. was not the day. That's not the kind of analysis you did for fall twenty nineteen, but for fall twenty eighteen, we just looked at what the institution said their maximum class size was for a co-requisite section. So it's, it's not great data, but there's an indication that smaller is better. Yeah, well, I, should be able to, I should be able to use with the, now, with the data I have this time, I should be able to see specifically how many students did each student actually experience and, and see what happened. And again, to see whether you know, again, there's two pieces of this, the number of students that they had in their prerequisite section and the number of students that they had in their credit bearing section. Again, both may well have a, uh, an impact. Great. Thanks, Jeremy. Great question. Time for a few more. All right, well, apparently I should have quit while I was ahead. But. <laughs> well, and we will be recording this. You can review it at your leisure. And if there are further questions, feel free to, you know, shoot them back to us and we will we will sort of post it as a response so that we can make sure that everybody gets sort of the same answer. Absolutely. All right. Well, Dr. Denley, thank you so much. And and to all and, and, and Barbara, again, thank you for joining us. And for, to all of y'all who have joined us, I really want to thank you and appreciate your time today. Um, 
Again, this will be, you all get an email letting you know that this video has been posted and, uh, you know, uh, invite you to share it with your colleagues. Um, and again, one of the, I think the, the big take home is that uh, you, we have had phenomenal success that rests on the back of a lot of great hard work, um, which we very much appreciate and recognize. And what we're using that hard work to do is identify where we have more opportunity to really squeeze out success. Because it's clear that this model is is successful. It is having it is having the outcomes we had hoped it would have and then some. And the goal now is to figure out where to go further because we know that there's still some some juice left in that lemon. And so without if, if there are, you know, as you think about your practice and as you come into the fall in this new environment, as you think about how this practice can shift towards engaging that mindset work and also structuring the course in a way that's going to really amplify your success, lean back on this data to, 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 to do it and, and let us know what your thoughts are uh, and your, your best practices are on that. And we'll share them with the community. So with that, I want to say thank you to all of you again, and we will uh, see you soon.